Good afternoon, everyone, from wherever you're coming from. It's great to have you again join us in the Data-Driven Ag webinar series. Uh, I often forget to introduce myself, but I'm not going to forget today. I'm Dennis Buckmaster, a professor in ABE and also a Dean's Fellow for Digital Agriculture. And we certainly we welcome you to this series. You can see some of the topics there. Uh, we've been doing this uh, each Thursday at 1230 Eastern Time. They are all recorded. And uh, if you find some of this to be of interest, then certainly promote it to your network after the fact. Uh, you'll, they'll be available on YouTube channel. So just a quick re uh, recognition of our support. Of course, you can tell from the coloring and the branding here, this is a Purdue sponsored series, Purdue Agriculture specifically. We have uh, a digital ag resources website, a, a specific site on UAVs and extension. And then also much of the work of the series, not necessarily today's work, but in general, uh, supported by the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. <clears throat> Next slide, there we go. So upcoming weeks, uh, you'll see today we're talking about digital forestry and we'll be back uh, with much of the same group here in two weeks on March 18. But on the other dates, you can now see we're gonna do a little bit about on-farm experimenting, produce safety, valuing of data, and then on into later April and May, uh, a little bit more about livestock systems, uh, a little more in UAV work, and then uh, ending with some machines and robotics. So we encourage you to participate in whichever topics suit you best. Next slide. So uh, we do encourage you to strongly use chat to pose your questions. When a question comes up, just uh, chat it to everyone. And we have a very good group uh, today that can address your questions. Uh, so without further ado, let me start the introductions here uh, as we sort of switch the slide deck there. Uh, our sequence of presenters are uh, Keith Wisting, uh, who is with the Hardwood Tree Improvement and Regenerative Center. He's an adjunct professor, assistant professor over in forestry and natural resources at Purdue. Uh, following him will be Brady Hardiman, he is, works in, he's also in forestry and natural resources. He works on uh, systems from the scale of the size of DNA to the scale of the size of the entire forest, actually. Uh, and then following him is uh, Ayman Habib, who's a professor in civil engineering with a great uh, focus in digital photogrammetry and GIS with mobile mapping systems. As part of that team, not necessarily presenting today, but also Gufan Shao and Song Lin Fei, also a forestry and natural resources, that entire group and more, their students and their extended group is in this group that we call the digital forestry group. And they have an initiative and you're gonna get a very good uh, eye-opening view today of the power of uh, digitizing forest in, in several different manners. So I hope you do enjoy uh, the presentation today. Uh, do feel free to pose your questions in chat. And uh, without further ado, uh, Keith, uh, we'll let you kick us off here. Thank you, Dennis. And, uh, following that, we'll be ready. Okay, let me get my screen up here. All right, so uh, to begin, uh, again, I'm a part of the Integrated Digital Forestry Initiative at Purdue University. It's a, it's a, a, a group of faculty and their students uh, across all colleges within the campus who are interested in using digital technologies to improve forestry. Uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first slide just uh, is an introduction. My colleague, Gofan Shao, is a uh, professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. I myself am uh, uh, a research scientist with the USDA Forest Service. This slide shows some of our students uh, testing out material, uh, testing out hardware in, uh, at um, the Martell Forest at Purdue. These are uh, uh, the members of a team that we call the Low Cost Optical Gauging System Team, which is uh, uh, developing a system that I will describe in just a few minutes. A structure from motion or phonar, whoops, sorry, 
is uh, is uh, a rapidly advancing field right now that starts with two dimensional uh, two dimensional images taken with cameras and combines them in various ways in order to create three dimensional images. Uh, uh, phonar or structure from motion is an extremely uh, rapidly advancing field and it uh, the most obvious uses of it have been facial recognition but uh, they go well beyond that. You can see from this uh, paper that's down here at the bottom with 25,000 citations uh, from 2016 that this is an area of great uh, scientific interest. Uh, structure from motion uh, has a lot of promise, as I said, uh, possibly as an alternative to LIDAR and other methods for, uh, for imaging forests. One of the problems with structure from motion is the, uh, the need to stitch the images together, which can be very computationally intensive and difficult. Uh, we were able to resolve a lot of that uh, problem by using the, the, the camera that we show here. It's a stereo camera. Uh, called a real sense depth camera and this stereo camera is very inexpensive it's only like 140 bucks for for this stereo camera and by using this camera we were able to make a breakthrough in assembling the images and using them to gain uh, data that we could use for measuring trees in a forest. Uh, Eliopoulos who's mentioned as the lead author on this paper here is an undergraduate researcher at Purdue. What we found is by using this stereo images from this camera, we could very rapidly and very efficiently measure trees. Diameter being one of the key features of a forest inventory, this slide on, on, the, on your left here shows a, a comparison of data taken with our camera in the red dots uh, versus a line showing the actual data measured by hand by a field forester. So you can see there's extremely high agreement with a uh, uh, very little outlier error. Uh, this slide uh, shows uh, the, on the far left is the sort of old fashioned way the data was taken in force using handheld devices uh, like hypsometers and rulers and, and tape measures. And in the center then is uh, a student using uh, one of these stereo cameras attached to a simple laptop. There's nothing special about that laptop. It's uh, the same one a, a typical student would use. And then on the right, uh, we've begun to apply machine learning in order to use the data that we ac acquire with a stereo camera uh, in order to train it to identify the ground, the background, branches, stems, et cetera. And the students have begun that process. You can see what's happening on the right there that they've been able to identify the ground versus the stem versus the branch, et cetera. And uh, they're working on other measures such as merchantable height, taper, et cetera, that are extremely useful to foresters who want to inventory the trees in a stand. The advantage of uh, stereo graphic photography versus, uh, to create structure from motion is, is what you can see here uh, with these owls. Uh, an, an owl with only one eye open uh, to generate a point cloud, it takes many images. But with a stereo camera, uh, the owl is able to generate the point cloud uh, and uh, we're able to extract data from the point cloud very effectively and efficiently. Uh, the, the general flow then is that uh, the stereo camera would be mounted on a vehicle or perhaps in a backpack and then processed in real time, actually. The data can be generated in real time. And we were able to show that uh, we could measure a stand of trees uh, in one hour uh, that contained a thousand trees, the same stand took a two-man crew a full day to measure. So that shows the kind of gain in efficiency that we expect with a system. This is my last slide. This is the, uh, this is the team of undergraduates uh, that's working on this project under the guidance of Professor Young Sang Lu and a, a program within the engineering school called the VIP program. And uh, 
uh, this program's been going on for about three years now, and the students rotate in and rotate out, but uh, they all learn and contribute and develop the same set of uh, software. Thank you very much, and uh, I guess we're ready for Brady. All right, hopefully you're seeing my slides now. All good. Uh, so I'm gonna talk really quickly about a project that we have going on where we're using terrestrial laser scanning to assess tree health and quality. Okay, um, so here's the team. I won't introduce everybody, but a, a lot of the folks are on the, the call today. So um, I will punt all the hard questions to them. Uh, but the, the crux of the idea here is that we're trying to uh, solve problems that we've been addressing in forestry and ecology for a long time using uh, methods that are far less quantitative than we're capable of today. And so we're trying to leverage some of those new capabilities to improve uh, how we quantify these things. And so ultimately our goal is to produce hardwood trees that have desirable traits and doing this by leveraging the capabilities of advanced LIDAR technology. So, um, so you'll see there's some substantial overlap between the photogrammetric methods that Keith just described um, and then some of the more advanced LIDAR methods that uh, Iman will describe uh, next. Um, but we're sort of illustrating a continuum of, of capabilities here and also a continuum of cost, which is something to keep in mind, I think. Um, so ultimately what we're trying to do is to evaluate the ability of terrestrial LIDAR to quickly and accurately quantify tree health and stand level indicators of uh, wood quality and also tree health, okay? Um, and we wanna make this as user-friendly as possible so that uh, you don't have to be a, a specialist in the technology in order to use it, right? And so our sandbox that we're playing in consists of 63 plots uh, of uh, young forest that was planted in 2007. Uh, the layout is shown here in the lower left, and every plot contains one to three species, American chestnut, black cherry, or northern red oak, and then these are planted at three different spacings, one, two, and three meters apart. Every plot has the same number of trees, so it's the spacing that really is um, different here. And so we're, we're using a terrestrial LIDAR system uh, from Leica called the BLK360, and we're measuring stand structure. So we go to the middle of the plot and we plunk this thing down and it scans in a hemisphere and generates a point cloud with 12 million data points, which allows us to digitize these forest stands and then start extracting structural features of interest. So I wanted to give a, a quick primer on LIDAR technology itself. So LIDAR is much like sonar or radar, um, except it's using pulses of light to measure the distance to some solid surface that reflects the light. If we do this fast enough um, and collect enough points, then we can create a digital rendering uh, of the forest that allows us to do uh, all sorts of interesting studies. So shown here is a portable canopy LIDAR. This is a system I built in grad school and we use um, some slightly updated versions of it still today. Uh, but one of, it's one of many different configurations of terrestrial LIDAR. This one is worn by the user and you walk along a transect through the forest generating a vertical slice. I'll describe that more in a minute. That's as opposed to a, a tripod mounted system which generates a, a hemisphere. Uh, and then Iman's gonna describe uh, another system in a little bit here. So if we think about the forest in its three dimensions, right? If, if the system, we use the system that I just described that is uh, worn by the user, it, it sh is shooting a laser beam upward into the canopy 2000 times a second. Um, and then recording those reflections, right? And so as the user walks that system along a transect, it's generating a vertical cross section or a slice through the canopy. And we can take those returns, those reflected laser pulses and bin them um, into this vertical cross section on the right. Um, and so you can see that we're just scaling this by the number of returned laser pulses uh, within each one square meter uh, area of the canopy. And so this has proven really useful for generating fine scale measurements of stand structure, it tells us where all the vegetation is within the canopy volume. And that has really interesting implications for light interception, which fuels growth rate, which turns into board feet, right? Um, or carbon storage, depending on whether you're 
where your interest is. Okay. Um, and so we can go from a real forest, like what's shown on the left here, and its corresponding cross section shown on the right. Um, and we are able to determine, you know, where in the canopy the trees are putting their leaf area, right? That's the most of the surface area within the canopy. Um, and then that lets us uh, diagnose important things about how the forest is functioning. If we walk multiple transects through the same stand, then we get multiple cross sections. Um, and we can stack those up like pages of a book um, and start getting some more three-dimensional information, even from the system that's inherently two-dimensional, right? And so we can generate things like interpolating a surface. Um, and this is a figure showing uh, a sequence of stands from 30 to 130 years old. Um, and we fit a surface across those vertical cross sections. And you can see that not only does the canopy get taller, over 130 years, as we might expect, but it also gets more structurally complex. It's bumpier, it has gaps um, where old trees have died and new trees have grown up. Um, and so this is really interesting and uh, tells us a lot about how the forest is functioning. All right, so we can go from this uh, set of vertical cross sections into a true volume. Um, by using the terrestrial LIDAR systems that, are, uh, that scan in three dimensions. And so that's what's illustrated in this bottom figure here. Um, and in this case, the LIDAR unit is rotating the laser beam um, in order to collect a full hemisphere, um, right? And so these are uh, what are usually called terrestrial laser scanners or, or terrestrial LIDAR systems. Um, and they can generate incredibly detailed high resolution scans of the internal canopy structure, which is often something that's missing from a lot of aerial LIDAR, um, where it's not able to penetrate into the canopy and, and finally resolve structures within the canopy volume. Um, there's, uh, the systems are getting increasingly sophisticated at aligning multiple scans. So you can change the position of the, the LIDAR unit where it's scanning from inside the stand um, and that will allow for a, a fully three-dimensional digital stand reconstruction, which allows for faster and more detailed forest inventory, as well as catalog cataloging the structural features that are indicators of tree health and quality that we're really interested in. Uh, excitingly, there's some new capabilities that are starting to come online. This is from a couple years ago, uh, where some colleagues have built a dual wavelength terrestrial LIDAR system, and so this is uh, this has two lasers at uh, different wavelengths to account for or to um, take advantage of the fact that leaves reflect in a different spectrum uh, than non photosynthetic tissues. And so this can allow us to distinguish between uh, leaf area and woody area, for example, or woody surfaces, right? We can get to this through some other ways, some, some of the photogrammetric methods that uh, Keith described earlier, uh, but this could potentially be a game changer. Right, so um, the way the, the system works or the workflow that we're trying to develop um, in order to create these user-friendly tools to um, calculate tree health and quality is we have this system that's tripod mounted and scans in a full hemisphere. Uh, and this, from this we generate a colorized point cloud because as it goes in addition to collecting uh, data, the reflected laser pulses which tell us distance basically, um, it's also collecting uh, color images as it goes, right? And so it can take those color images and project it onto the point cloud, which lets us look at the, the true color image uh, in three dimensions. And this is from a single scan in the center of the plot, but we're actually looking at it from outside the plot. If we'd collected more scans within the plot and aligned those point clouds, we would have a, it would um, not be quite as speckly as what you're seeing here. From this colorized point cloud, it's a, it's a three dimensional volume, and then we can section it um, either vertically or horizontally. And so here, this is a, a horizontal cross section at about a meter off the ground. Um, and since we've only scanned once in the center of the plot, uh, the trees that are surrounding it, you see it uh, a crescent shape, right? Because it's only seeing one side of the tree. But then we can take those crescent shapes and we can fit circles to them that are uh, indicators of the tree diameter. And from that, we can calculate uh, the woody volume and all sorts of other features that are interesting, right? Um, and I think Iman's going to present a little uh, more detail on this to follow. But the size of those circles, and we don't have to just sample at one meter off the ground, we can sample every 10 centimeters from the uh, forest floor all the way to the top of the tree, 
And that lets us look at things like uh, the taper of the stem, uh, which will tell us things like the amount of wood. Uh, we can also look for the alignment between those different cross sections. And so we can see, does the tree lean? Is it curved? This tells us something about the potential quality of the wood. Um, and then we can look for deformations in the, the shape of the bowl, things like bulges that might indicate some sort of health issue, right? Um, and so these are some figures that are generated by Abdel Holloway, who uh, is a member of the team. And uh, so we can reconstruct the stems. Uh, this is uh, just from some, they're, they're fairly sophisticated methods, but they're not where we're trying to get to just yet. Um, but we can, we can trace that stem vertically to see, is it leaning, is it bent, does it curve, those sorts of things. Um, and then we're working on more advanced methods to fit circles um, to the, the crescents that we observe from that single LIDAR scan in a way that will get us to better estimates of wood volume, um, and then also some of these indicators of quality. And so if we think about all of these tree attributes that we traditionally use to assess wood quality and health, um, we actually can get a lot of these from even a single scan of a terrestrial lighter unit in a, a forest stand. Uh, things like not just diameter, but taper, height, um, height of the branches, number of branches, branch angle, which is really important if you want to know things like the likelihood of a branch to break off in a windstorm or an ice storm. So you can make informed pruning decisions. Um, you could also make informed decisions about which trees to uh, preemptively cull from a stand because they're not going to be producing quality wood, right? Um, and then as we go forward, we're interested in incorporating some of the color metric data from the RGB images that are collected at the same time that could uh, provide us additional information about uh, health and quality. And so, for example, in these stands which have American chestnut, they're reaching a size and age where they're starting to be infected by uh, chestnut blight. And that shows up as an orangish sort of fungus on the trunk that would show up in those color uh, images as well. Okay, um, and so this is my last slide. And so I'll hand it off to Ayman and then quickly I wanna acknowledge the support and funding from HTIRC. So, thank you. So, hello everyone. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, All good. Okay, thank you. So, uh, today I would like to follow up on uh, using terrestrial mobile LiDAR for a scalable high resolution uh, digital forest inventory. So the, the objective we are working on is that we would like to evaluate the possibility of using mobile mapping systems to provide geospatial data that meets the needs of uh, digital forestry. And our objective is to have a scalable single tree inventory. So I'll talk very quickly about mobile mapping systems from a technology point of view, what do they mean? And then, uh, some potential systems that we have developed unmanned aerial vehicles or systems and backpack system. And the majority of the talk will be about the backpack system. And then some preliminary results that we collected uh, on Martel Forest that Brady uh, re mentioned in his talk. So this data we collected last Saturday on February 27. And just the future outlook where we can go from here. So mobile mapping system, those are mapping systems that are on a movable platform. You have a, a variety of sensors. Those can be cameras, it can be LiDAR, uh, it can be GPS uh, units and inertial measurement units. So at the end, actually, you have a, a very precise information about the trajectory of the platform within the environment, as well as some data it could be imagery, point clouds, uh, that you will use to do the mapping of the environment. So when we talk about mobile mapping systems, the, I would say the traditional platforms are airborne, I'm referring to mainly manned aircraft or high resolution or imaging, or sorry, space platforms. Now you can have the mobile mapping platform on a wheel-based vehicle. So these are examples of wheel-based vehicle for transportation application for uh, digital agriculture. This particular system is mainly for, done for uh, phenotyping. You can have unmanned vehicles, could be either airborne vehicles or even ground vehicles. 
So we are using the unmanned airborne vehicle and ground vehicles for above canopy and in canopy mapping for um, sorghum and uh, maize. And portable mobile mapping system where you have a backpack that has, in this case, a LiDAR uh, navigation unit, a camera, and a GPS. So just to give you an idea, this is just examples of unmanned aerial vehicles equipped with cameras that could be either RGB cameras, hyperspectral cameras, uh, uh, shortwave infrared cameras, thermal cameras, LiDAR, and also the navigation units. So we have been using those uh, platforms uh, in Purdue for precision agriculture, more specifically phenotyping, forest inventory, uh, infrastructure monitoring, and environmental management. This is the backpack system. So it has a camera. That's what you see here. It has a navigation unit, what you have here, a LiDAR unit. And the original uh, purpose of developing this one is to map ditch line along road networks. And I'm focusing now on digital forestry. So just to give you an idea, these are just the systems. So the LiDAR systems here, this system here, for example, which we have on our UEV, emits over half a million pulse per second. This uh, LiDAR system, which we have on our backpack, emits over a quarter million pulse per second. Uh, in this case, um, the cost, just to give you an idea, this sensor here is roughly $35,000. And this system here is like this unit is $5,000. But the price of these units are coming, uh, are getting cheaper uh, every month, I would say. And the main reason, because also the auto uh, uh, automotive industry is quite interested in LiDAR sensors as a potential aiding sensor for connected and uh, autonomous vehicles. So the, the data which I will show today is captured by both. UEV, the system, and the backpack system, but the major focus on the backpack system. As Brady mentioned that with LiDAR, if you have the system on a, a platform, you have to more or less align the successive scans from different locations. So you have to do a registration. So in order to eliminate the need for doing this registration or identifying the motion of the scanner from one location to another, you rely on what we call uh, global navigation or GPS satellite systems, as well as inertial measurement unit. So these are the two units. This is the navigation unit that gives us the position and the orientation of the UEV system. And that's a navigation unit which we have on the backpack system. So this system we bought five years ago, it was like $25,000. Right now you can buy systems with similar or even better performance in the cost of 10 to $15,000. So my main point here is that even the systems are expensive right now, but because of the huge market that relies on these navigation units, lighters and cameras, the prices will come down uh, in the near future. So I'm not really uh, going to do the math here, but the whole idea actually we have I'm not sure what happened, sorry about that. So yes, so you have actually your navigation unit, you give you the position and the orientation. You have the LiDAR unit, and basically by knowing the relationship between your LiDAR unit and navigation unit, you can derive the coordinates. So the system here, because again, we are moving as we are acquiring the data, we rely on the navigation unit, and up to a point, like we can handle uh, situations where we have outages or loss of lock with the GPS signal. So just to give you an idea about like the data that we collected, this is in Martel Forest. We collected this uh, last Saturday. So this is just a sample of the point clouds that have been collected by this backpack system. So uh, just to give you more detail about the study site, this is in Martel Forest. So we have four areas, area one, so in area one, we had three uh, data acquisitions from UEV systems. We started in 2018 and 2020. And with the backpack system, we collected something on February or last uh, Saturday. Uh, area two and three and four, those are only collected by the backpack system. So just to uh, put it in perspective, areas one, two, 
and three are plantations where you have structured uh, forestry and area four is a natural forest. So the, just the first part here, just to compare the uh, airborne system with the backpack system. So we just look into this profile here in area one. So those are the data sets that have been captured by the UEV system in 2018 in red, the UEV system in 2020 in green, and the backpack system in uh, February 21. So just to show you the data set, like the profile individually, this is again the UEV in 2018, and this is the UEV in 2020. So you can see here the, uh, the growth of the canopy, and this is the data in 2021 from the backpack. So one thing here, just to make sure that because we are relying on the GPS IMS technology, so all the point clouds come in a global reference frame. So basically the data you acquire over the years are in the same reference frame and it's quite easy or straightforward to compare these over time. So just to give you an idea about the level of detail you get from the backpack, we are just zooming on those individual trees. That's what you see here from the backpack system. This is another data in area two. So here we had one track actually going from north to south. This is a plot we are interested in, plot 119. So here, the amount of time it took us to do this track, one of the tracks is just 100 seconds. So uh, I will be mainly focusing on this area and more particularly the first two rows here of those uh, point clouds captured by those tracks. So in this particular track here from the south to the, uh, sorry, from the north to the south, it was took 100 seconds. We are capturing roughly 30 million points and we do filtering to the remove all the ground points because we are interested in whatever is above the ground. So we have 18 million points in this point cloud here. So we'll just do a, a fly through. So this is a fly through uh, over the data. So again, this is here we are flying. All the points we are having here are above ground points. They are colored by height. Blue, it means it's very close to the ground and red, it goes, that's basically, it's quite higher, which is the top of the tree. So you can see here as we are walking, actually there are lots of bushes under the tree. So we are capturing this with a LiDAR system. And basically here, this fly through, we're just going through the rows and then doing a turn and going to the other row. So you can see here, this is some of our graduate students that we have standing actually while we are doing the track. So this is actually, we are flying another, um, line here. So you can see the individual trees are captured, although actually we are moving in the track which is very far from the trees. You can get nice information about the structure of the trees and I will show more details um, later. So then we are moving actually now. So this is the, uh, so our actual track was this one here. So here this is how we walked while collecting the data. That's basically the track we walked. And these are all these rows to the left and right were captured from this single track. So I'll just let the, vo uh, the video go just for maybe 10 or 20 seconds. And then I will switch to the next slide. So these are the graduate students who are standing by while we are doing the data collection. And that gives you an idea about the fidelity of the point cloud or the level of detail you get for the point cloud as we are collecting the data. So uh, this is the row one, which I will talk about right now, and this is row two. So you can see here in this particular plot, there was more management of the bushes under the canopy. So you can see here, we don't have too many points as we have seen in the previous plot. So this is like for row one, we have an automated approach for detection of the individual rows when we have a structured data. We have also automated approaches for the identification of the individual trees. So each tree is represented in a different color. And then I'm just going to focus on one of the trees here, like tree 12 in row one. So this is the, the tree. We cut an area here uh, to uh, determine the diameter. So this is like a, we do have cylinder fitting. And then this is the uh, diameter of the, 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 the cylinder here. We fit is like 16.5 centimeters. 
So we did field measurements and we have two sets of field measurements. This is like, actually we did this measurement ourselves. So we came up with a diameter of 19 centimeter. This was measurement was done by forestry. Uh, so it was 15.6. So this is the estimated from the LIDAR and these are from two different types of measurement system. So now we move to the second row, which is not next to the track. So this is row two. So these are the detected tree automatically, individual trees. And then also we identify the individual tree location. So each one of these lines represent a location of an individual tree. So I'm looking again on tree 12 in the second row. So again, we do the fitting of the cylinder. So this tree has a diameter of 12.2 centimeters. From the field measurements, we have somewhere between 9.8 to 13 centimeters. So basically, this is going back to what Brady was saying, that you can uh, analyze the individual trees and you drive lots of uh, information about the uh, features or attributes you would like to get from the tree. So this is an area three. This is a more mature forest. I will just focus on this particular location here. This is the tree. Uh, this is actually, again, we are doing um, a cylinder fitting. So we just plug this area. So manually we measure the diameter is 35 centimeters. And here we have a total of 78,000 points. And when we fit the cylinder, this is the diameter we get. So once you have the data, actually you can actually have the tree, you can do cross sections at different heights. And that gives you more information about the tree of the structure as well as other uh, attributes you would like to get from the point cloud data. So I'll just let you just watch this one again. So we will start from the bottom and then we'll go up. So here, this is only derived from one track. If you do multiple tracks, so in this case, the, uh, the tree will be complete, I would say. So this is really the most challenging area was area four, that's a natural forest. So there actually you can see it's much more denser. We have more challenges because of the GNSS signal, but this is really the, the focus of the current research, how to improve the trajectory when you have sustained uh, a blockage of the GNSS signal. So in summary, what uh, I would like to say that mobile LIDAR or mobile mapping systems can provide very high resolution data and gives you precise and reliable point cloud data in a very short time. And it, in order to achieve this one, you have to have very accurate system calibration. And that's one of the key areas of our research, as well as a, a very accurate trajectory of the system. The LiDAR point clouds, you, you can do individual tree detection, localization of the tree and deriving quantitative information. And our current and for, uh, future research is focusing on the integration of image and point cloud data. We do not claim that uh, LiDAR is better than imagery or the other way around. The synergy between the two, that's really the, the, the key. And uh, there is lots of effort that needs to be done. And there are lots of things that can be done in improving the quality of the trajectory when you have loss of lock uh, with the GPS or global navigation satellite systems inside the canopy. We would like to expand this actually work from uh, plantations to natural forestry. We have more challenges there. And as Brady mentioned, making sure that we have good data to do the biometric extraction of the trees. So uh, for even more scalable uh, implementation, we think that you can ride actually an ATV and you can cover larger areas in a larger time. And as we mentioned, it's not really a single system will not give you all the information you are looking for. You have to integrate data from ground, above ground, whether it's uh, UEVs or manned aircraft or even satellite system with different modalities, whether it's RGB, multispectral, hyperspectral, and LIDAR. And our objective, that that's what the Digital Forestry Group is to do this, um, I would say very high resolution uh, inventory at the three plot stand landscape and regional inventory. So thank you very much. And I have to acknowledge the support. And I have to really say lots of this uh, work is mainly um, a result of our work in the area of agriculture and phenotyping of corn and soil. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, all three of you, and uh, uh, Gufan and uh, Sung Lin. Go ahead and if you could all just turn on your webcams, we can do a little bit of Q&A time. I just feel obligated to throw this out. Brady, you were mentioning something about the BLK 360. That must, the B must be from Binford. So this has to be a home improvement. It's a BLK 360 model, something or other. Uh, and then uh, Ayman, uh, I see you had area one, area two and area three. What about area 51? We're all interested in that one. Uh, that's the next step then. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to sort of defer to you fellows uh, to go ahead and look in the chat and maybe uh, for the purpose of the recording, they won't see the chat. So you may need to rephrase the question and then also provide an answer. So just do it sort of in the order that seems natural to you. Uh, I look forward to your responses here. One of the questions that came up that uh, I think the other team members or the other presenters are better able to answer is, in what ways do you see these technologies as complementary? So maybe I, I can start and then definitely uh, um, Keith and Brady would, uh, would comment. So like for the, the most important thing about, let's say it was cameras, that you have more than one channel. So even LiDAR right now, you have this uh, multi-spectral LiDAR that gives you like returns in different wavelengths. But from cameras, if you have the RGB, multi-spectral, hyperspectral cameras, you will have more signatures that could be helpful in disease uh, as well as species recognition. So there are lots of advantages of having there in terms of the cameras. LiDAR, I would say the, the, the one of the key advantages, especially when we deal with forestry, is that when you look at photogrammetry, it only looks at the visible surface. Whatever is really um, close to the camera on the line of the size of the camera, you can see. LiDAR, because of the fact it's just an active sensor and you have the energy is concentrated within, I would say, an area. So if you hit the surface and there are some gaps like leaves or between the leaves or uh, at the edge of the trunks, some of the energy will continue and you will still have return. So in this case, you will see the visible surface as well as below the visible surface. So these are just two examples of the advantages of uh, imagery and light. Um, and I also would uh, uh, add what uh, Ayman just said. Um, you know, these different sensors have different advantage and disadvantage in the uh, in situ situation, but also that, uh, um, you know, later we'll also present, uh, you will have the different platforms, either the backpack system or the, uh, you know, mounted on ATV or in an aerial system because you allows you to look at above and look at below so you can have uh, different efficiencies in terms of measuring for the, the, the LIDAR system that I must, you know, just demonstrated if we think about if we mount this on an ATV, uh, we can literally can measure, you know, thousands or ten thousands of trees in just half an hour. Um, but what that system does not tell you at the moment is what species they are. And so you need those other sensors, either uh, in RGB to do uh, image recognition of the box or the hyperspectral that we didn't cover today uh, to, to do the species identification, which is a, a key signature for, uh, or information for forestry. One important thing I think to keep in mind is that these, all of these systems can do what, what we've done for decades in the field a lot quicker and with a lot of accuracy. Um, we're approaching the point where we can do it with more accuracy than with the traditional methods, right? Because anyone who has ever used a diameter tape to measure thousands of trees knows that if you shift the tape up or down a little bit, uh, that can affect your estimate, how tight you pull the tape around the tree, especially on a tree with uh, a lot of rough bark um, can make a big difference. And so you could end up with more uh, error between users or between years measuring the same tree uh, than you would have using some of these methods but and so while it can do those things faster and more accurately and with more 
um, replicability, I think it's important to remember that we're substituting that for more effort on the back end to analyze the data. And so one of the things that we're really trying to figure out is how to automate those post-processing um, steps and to make them more user-friendly so that, you know, right now for a couple thousand dollars, you could put together a pretty sophisticated LIDAR system and go out and scan your forest. Um, but then you would need to figure out how to use all of the data as well. So we want to make that as user-friendly as possible so that the end user who can increasingly afford this equipment can also derive useful information from it. I'll, I'll jump in there too and, and say that it's possible that some systems, some types of sensors um, might be able to return real-time data. So if, by integrating different types of sensors, you might be able to say, look, we can give you real-time data for these traits. And uh, if you've got a couple of hours back in, uh, back in the office, we can give you uh, uh, post analytical time, uh, data along these parameters for the other traits. And so it kind of, it kind of depends on the mixture of traits you want and when you want them. Um, just to drill on this topic a little bit more is, um, you know, in traditional forestry measurement, when we are say, estimating the, the volume of a tree, we are utilizing some, you know, a, a pre-calibrated -cal uh, formulas. For example, you do volume, you need to have to assume form class 78 or form class 80. Well, with these new LIDAR systems, um, or you know the the, the the optical systems that you now can individualize like what people are saying today you can individualize the medicine well you can have individualized um, a form class for your for each of the tree and you can get actual uh, a volume of the tree for every single one So there were just a couple of questions about like the LIDAR, about the distances, and then also the longevity of the sensor. So uh, for LIDAR, uh, like the, the sensors we are using, the minimum range is one meter. The maximum range is 100 meters for the backpack system and for the uh, UEV system is 200 meters. So you have uh, anywhere in between those ranges. The only thing that actually was a distance because as Brady mentioned, you have these uh, systems uh, firing at equal uh, angular increments. So the closer the objects, you will have more details compared to farther objects. In terms of the longevity of the sensors, like these are like um, mechanical units, they have the laser. So usually they come with maybe 5,000 to 10,000 uh, uh, hours of operation. But right now, there is actually the technology is moving in solid state, which will be much, much longer. I saw one question here from Dennis. I answered to him directly. I did it wrong. Uh, the distance between camera and the trees, the camera we used uh, depend on what camera we use, also de depend on the tree size. Uh, but our current technology, current experiment, uh, three to six meters are the optimum uh, distance between camera and the trees to get a centimeter accuracy in tree diameter measurement. So one question I did want to pose, and I think it ties into one that Marjorie posed back in chat, uh, but I was really glad to see Brady highlight what he called the workflow. Like you're gonna get data, you're gonna do this thing, then you're gonna do the other thing. I think there is a lesson to be learned just from having a work mindset and what you do. Uh, and what, how many uh, years into this work did it take until you got the idea that we need a workflow? Like the first time you do it, you just, you know, you iterate and you do some processing and then you finally get an answer. But as you want to automate processes, you sort of have to have that workflow mindset. So can you, are there any lessons learned from that, that would be the first question. And then to tie it into Marjorie's question, maybe somebody can respond to, are there any crossover technologies here that could be used in areas other than forestry, like crops, maybe even livestock? Like how could we use these same technologies in other areas of agriculture? That's a pretty open-ended, but I'm anxious 
to hear your responses. So I can take the workflow question, um, although Keith and Iman should weigh in as well, I think. Um, so I inherited a workflow from um, an advisor who designed the original system that I built in grad school, but it was based on Fortran code, which I didn't know. So it translated into MATLAB um, and that's how I learned to code. But then uh, MATLAB's not open source. So eventually we had a postdoc that translated that into an R package, uh, which is open source and you can download the package and et cetera. Um, but then I've worked with other systems, including, I realize I actually have the, the Leica BLK360 right here, um, which have incredibly proprietary and black box type workflows. So you buy their, their technology, and then they really what they're trying to sell you on is a subscription to their software to process the data. And so in a lot of cases, it's actually hard to get a hold of the raw data um, and this system was actually designed for real estate agents and architects to scan inside rooms. Um, that's their primary application or their primary market, I guess. Um, and so the things that they're measuring are actually structurally far simpler than a forest. And so to calculate that data or to, to process that data and calculate the things we're interested in requires a very different workflow than the software they provide. Um, and so, so my the impetus for me wanting to develop a workflow that's user friendly and with the end user in mind is that um, most people aren't going to have either the technical capacity to process the data themselves using an R package um, or they're not going to want to pay for you know a five thousand dollar software suite um, that's not even well adapted to forests and so that's those are sort of the motivating forces to develop a user friendly uh, suite of tools. Uh, just briefly, our students are mostly using ROS, the robot operating system, which is open source, and, uh, and doing most of their coding in Python. So like just for, for the backpack system, usually the workflow that once we do the data acquisition, uh, we, uh, it's po all based on post processing. So we uh, use the GPS data collected by our system together with the um, continuously operating reference stations, which are freely available to process the GPS data to get the highest accuracy. We do the GPS INS integration with a LIDAR to get the point cloud. So this process usually takes maybe one and a half hour to reconstruct a one half hour data acquisition. So I would say one to one in terms of the data acquisition. Once you have this one, the point clouds, you can use uh, your own tools as a point uh, cloud processing libraries or other libraries that for doing the data processing for us, because we are within a research institute, we develop our own um, uh, software packages that will give us higher level of transparency. And Dennis mentioned about this uh, transition. I would say our systems, we develop those systems mainly for agriculture, for digital agriculture, for uh, phenotyping. So we have been working in the area of phenotyping uh, for um, corn and sorghum for the last five years. And that's how we were able to adapt the systems directly to go to digital forestry. And we have been doing the same thing with transportation, infrastructure monitoring and environmental monitoring. To add on, Dennis, your, your question about how can this be applied to other area of agriculture? Well, you know, the, the, uh, some discussions are happening uh, at the moment. They're thinking about, you know, the exact the same system. You can, we can use that in horticulture, you know, your, your orchard, that is also a tree. And, uh, uh, or in the winery that you, you grow grapes and all that. So these are all directly transferable, like immediately thinking about the, the applications. Good. Well, I see we're approaching time. Uh, Song Lin, could you just give us a preview? We're going to be back to the topic of digital forestry in two weeks. Uh, what can we look forward to learning uh, in a couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, so in uh, two weeks, uh, eight, uh, March 18th, we will focus, today we're focusing on terrestrial systems. Uh, on the 18th, we'll focus on the aerial system talking about the, uh, the best practices for uh, uh, UAS, you know, uh, operation capturing images 
what is capable with this, uh, this di different digital platform than technology for tree inventory. Great, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, so again, thanks to everyone for participating today. Good uh, series of Q&A there in chat. Uh, feel free to keep that going a little bit uh, if you'd like, if your schedule permits, but we do invite you to come back for the upcoming weeks. Uh, and of course, if you happen to miss one and it was of interest to you, just watch for it at the Digital Ag Resources website. We'll have them all posted. So I wish you all the best. Spring is around the corner. Uh, I hope you have a great day. And uh, thanks again for coming today.